You're about to join Jerry Parker, Maritz Siebert, and Niels Kostrup Larsen on their raw and honest journey into the world of systematic investing and learn about the most dependable and consistent yet often overlooked investment strategy. Welcome to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. Jerry Parker, Maurit Siebert, and I, Niels Kastelassen, are back with this week's edition of the Systematic Investor Series, where each week we focus on helping you build safer and better performing portfolios by including trend following in the mix, and where we do our best to answer all of your questions. Good morning, Jerry. Good afternoon, Maurit. How are you guys doing? Good afternoon, Niels. Good morning, Jerry. Doing great. Doing great. How are you? Good stuff. Yeah, good stuff, good stuff. First off, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, all of our listeners who keep sending us your feedback and your kind words about the podcast, both publicly via tweets and other social media posts, but also the many emails we get each week. Um, you know, not only are they lovely to receive, of course, but it really does increase our commitment to hear how much value you get from these uh, conversations that we have each week. So a big thanks to all of you for all of the support that you show us. Now, looking at this week, um, personally, I did not pick up any really major events. Uh, look more like a continuation of the week before with firm equity prices, softer bond prices, energy well bit. Um, so we could say maybe the risk on environment continues. Uh, and of course, no surprise. Um, we saw a big down move in the VIX. Uh, which I think is down almost 50% so far this year. So uh, with that in mind, Moritz, I'll be interested to hear um, how your week panned out. So-so. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so-so, yeah. But uh, pretty much like you said, I mean, um, you know, along the bonds and and that cost money um, as they as they retreated. Um, still have some short gasoline, short heating oil positions on, uh, which lost some money. But that was offset with long equities, long the dollar, and you know one of my favorite markets still, uh, the emissions contract, uh, which I continue to be long, and that has had a quite quite a comeback and a new breakout uh, to the upside. So, uh, you know, mixed week, a uh, little bit down, but uh, but nothing major. I mean, I agree on our side. I mean, also a little bit down for the week. Um, really, the main drivers was to the downside for sure, uh, fixed income. Not all of them, but 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 certainly most of them, um, and also the euro uh, hurt a little bit. Um, but other currencies did actually okay for us. Uh, equities were fine, small uh, wins overall. Um, uh, the biggest winner, funnily enough, was coffee. Uh, that did really well. Uh, live cattle was okay, um, but overall, yeah, we also gave back a little bit more. Uh, performance, which I think we'll see later on when we go through the industry, might be a little bit different to what what's happening in the industry, which uh, maybe I'd love to hear your opinion about that. Um, Exposure-wise, not a big change, you know, fixed income, um, you know, long that sector, long stocks, uh, still short the energies to, uh, to some extent, um, long the dollar, short commodities in general. Um, yeah, so... Not a lot of new stuff going on on our side either this week, but the single stock market is always an unknown, Jerry. So how did that uh, turn out? And you had a great week, by the way, on all fronts, I guess. Um, yeah, certainly um, avoiding uh, the bond trends and not having positions, material positions and interest rates helped uh, keeping the stock positions. Uh, obviously a good idea. I think it's, I like to, uh, focus on uh, these three particular markets that I have positions in, hogs and emissions and palladium. So um, two of the three are looking pretty good. Uh, emissions and hogs had some volatility and slam dunks against us, against the trend. And our long-term uh, exit is pretty far away. So they uh, thankfully went back to new highs and uh, being patient, being longer term, looked good there, but the palladium tried to make a rally up and maybe that is going to um, be one of those that looks good for a long period of time then gets slammed and our long-term nature doesn't uh, work out very well but it is kind of interesting to kind of see that not everything that has fall and gets hurt and gets hit uh, doesn't uh, go back to the high some sometimes they do 
Yeah, you you used the word slam dunk, which is of course what I refer to when I said you had a great week on on many fronts. <clears throat> oh yeah, the basketball worked out well for me as I was recording last week from Minneapolis in the NCAA yeah. Final Four, and our team won. UVA won, first time ever, uh, a miracle, miracle finish. So uh, lots of fun. I'm getting chills right now just thinking about it. <laughs> Good stuff. So I guess Twitter was uh, perhaps maybe, you know, quiet in the beginning of the week while you were watching all this sports going on, but then uh, firing up as you uh, secured the win and uh, got back to uh, normalcy. So what uh, what caught people's attention this week uh, on that front? Well, as I was saying before we went on, uh, some of my Twitter friends, just so reliable, they they tweet such good things and fun and interesting and just a different way of looking at and I'm learning things all the time and uh, I just all I have to do is hit the retweet button so it's really easy and nice and uh, of course Wayne is one of those guys who's a really smart guy and maybe we'll have uh, Wayne on our show one of these days and uh, he sure. had multiple great points this week um, and I'll just start with one of them uh, this sort of hits home for me because uh, had some of these experiences and he tweets uh, i was recalling my early days on a prop trading desk how some traders would high five after good trades or else slam their keyboards on the desk after bad ones decades later i see the problem with these actions in trading there's no place for emotions manage your insights i've definitely uh, broken some phones before way way back a long time ago but uh that was like one of the first lessons i learned in trading um, the emotional is never a good response. So if you're going to set yourself up to be systematic with rules, you know, you would think, well, that eliminates that problem, but it really doesn't. You fight that probably a lot or your whole career, but I think it's, it's a winnable fight. Yeah. It certainly rings some bells with me. I mean, as I started my career, actually as a trader, a bond trader, and I remember back in 1989, it's funny how you still remember one or two single trades, but I just remember back then when the uh, Berlin wall came down and I'd been short some bonds overnight, a pretty sizable position, uh, you know, for the time. And and was just massively up, you know, that morning coming in and feeling, you know, incredibly good about it, even though it will probably be just be luck really um, now in hindsight. Um, but then all the p &L went away um, and kind of ended up probably, I think it's from memory, ending up as a small losing trade. And I think that 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 really was uh, a painful experience, which, um, yeah, 30 years later, I still remember it. So it must have, um, yeah, I'm not sure about the keyboards, but um, it certainly was painful at the time. Um, what about you, Morris? Does this ring a bell before you became systematic? <laughs> <laughs> we all have those war stories. Um, look, I mean, being on a trading floor for, you know, many, many years with 400 people on it, 80% of those probably men, you see some uh, weird things going on, right? Um, as it relates to keyboards and phones and screens and uh, behavior and language. But um, so I've, I've seen it all. Uh, <laughs> But I've never been one of the people to uh, to actually, um, you know, do it do it myself. So, uh, you know, the the keyboard stayed intact, and uh, and so did the phones. So uh, no accidents here. But uh, I know exactly what you guys are talking about. And you know, Wayne uh, had another tweet. I'll, I'll just have to go on memory, but it was something like, uh, "If you want to be a, become a better trader, uh, trade, 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 trade." So he just he just wrote "trade" like right. fifty times. Yeah. And so. Uh, and so I t responded to that by saying, uh, well, if you want to you know, kind of want to get to that level where you can do a lot of trading, you need to trade small. Right. And I think that is sort of the root of my, of the problems of my emotional uh, problems or phone, the slamming of the phones and the, the destroying of telephones or whatever, is that I probably was just trading too large. And I think that is a big problem with a strategy you know, that if you make it hard to follow and, and uh, so many times over the years, I remember you know, I'd get this phone call at eight o'clock in the morning, as soon as there be, the market's open, oh, we're down 2% today. Oh man, what is going on? <laughs> so we had good systems, we had good diversification, we had good markets. And look, if you don't want to be down 2%, then trade smaller. Yeah. You mm -hmm. know? And so this is the root problem of 
cause of a lot of issues with traders. Uh, this is 1983. <clears throat> you know, follow your systems, trade small. And so, what does trade small mean? It means, you know, maybe so you can sleep at night and you have a good life. And, um, you know, even though we were making 200% with the swings that one would have like that, and then I toned it down in 1988 to maybe target 20%. You know, 20% still produces some uh, big swings. It's hard to imagine nowadays, isn't it, that you you were dialing your systems to make, you know, more than 100%. Let's just keep it at that level, right? When you think about how investors react today, um, you know, to uh, volatility and up days, up months, up weeks, and, and certainly the down uh, days, weeks, month, um, you know, clearly they would never be able to, to, uh, to stand that. Um, and um, so I, th- and, and, but, but yet we still see that as an issue, right? I mean, where um, people coming into the industry, perhaps, um, where it's, you know, it's, it's just a very easy trap to go to or, or path to go down. Uh, it's just to trade too large, um, you know. So it, it's an important point. What about you, more? It's just out of curiosity. I mean, did you have kind of a a certain you know moment where you realized that oh, trading size wise, I need to I need to change, or were you always as you as you of course are the sensible guy here, um, doing it right from the beginning. <laughs> Uh, I wouldn't say I've been doing it right from the beginning. I mean, it's, uh, you know, two sides of that coin. Obviously, you know, you want to make money and good P&L, so you size up the positions. But like Jerry said, that can get you into a position where, you know, you fail to sleep well at night and uh, uh, and you're worried about it. And, and that is something that you want to avoid. Um, but yeah, I remember uh, periods where I had positions in markets and they were limited. Uh, couldn't get out of them or needed to trade out of the spread markets. And, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, I think those positions were too large. Uh, it just uh, happened to to work out relatively well, I guess. Um, but other than that, I mean, the, the modeling that we can do with historical data, we can get, you know, a good sense for, you know, into what direction do we want that dial to go? How, how, volatile, how much vol do we want to have? How much risk do we want to have on? And I still like, you know, where I am at and like my point in life, um, I don't mind trading at too many vol. That is that is a level that I can can stomach. Uh where, you know, yeah, sure, sometimes that hits a pain point and there are months in there where yes, you do you're down more than, you know, minus ten or you're up more than ten. So there there are swings in there. Uh, but um uh those are those are still levels that I can I can work with. Yeah, but yeah. you know it's it's really it depends on uh, it's it's an individual thing. It's it's highly subjective. Some people would be able to stand it, and uh, it would be too much heat for them to trade at that at that level and and have a month that does minus ten, and they would pull the plug then. So yeah, both sides of the coin count. I've uh, been on the podcast with. You, Moritz, and I've heard you mentioned uh, plus or minus 10, and there's no fear in your voice. So that's nice. And I think I had no fear because it's going to emanate from the person who you're working with and for and your clients. And if you have a company or an individual like I had who designed the systems, they were his, designed the leverage. Uh, when we lost money, he gave us more money to manage, you know, mm-hmm. so you're like, whoa, that's pretty sweet. And um, so that's where your confidence is going to come from. If it's hundreds and thousands of clients in your fund, some of them you may not even know, you know, that's not the type of, you don't know what, you don't always know what kind of support you might have. Uh, uh, are we all on the same page here? Um, usually not. And you're, it's one of the part of being a CTAs, you have to guess, uh, is my leverage too low? Is it too high? Everyone else is making more money. Um, I know when Winton lowered their leverage back after 2008, dramatically, if, if I think, uh, I think I was like, oh, no, no, we can't do that. You know, that's crazy. And uh, But then over the years, I was like, oh, yeah, that was a smart move. So I think it depends upon who you work for and who your clients are and knowing your clients. I agree with that. 
And I think that, you know, these days, um, just by, you know, speaking to, you know, institutional investors, all sorts of people, there is a, um, you know, people favor low volatility strategies. It's, it's kind of like that thing where, you know, even less than 10 fall, you know, I hear people say, I'd like to trade at five fall and you know, have a managed futures or trend following type of trading strategy, whatever it is at five fall. And so they, they kind of like that, you know, low vol, um, range boundy returns, no big surprises. There's not a day that's more than 1% up. There's not a day that's more than 1% down. It's really, I, I'm not sure why that happened, but I have the feeling that it's lower, 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 lower since, since many, many years. And I kind of like feel like, uh, like an exotic outlier at 20 um, whereas, uh, you know, probably 30 years back, uh, if you trade a 20 vol, you were right, right, right in the middle. And there were like as many people trading even higher than 20 as they were trading lower, but 20 wasn't, you know, wasn't something that, that was exotic. Feels like these days it is. Why, why do you think this is, by the way, I'm just curious. I mean, is this all driven by risk-free rate of returns going down and therefore, um, you know, quote unquote, the benchmark, so to speak, for what kind of returns you should be shooting for goes down, or is there something different yeah, going interesting. on? interesting. I don't know. People just like that smoothness, that stability, that, you know, no surprise, don't let me down, no career risk. Um, you know, I, I, I don't have a 100% clear answer to that, Neil, so I'd, I'd like to have it. Yeah. I have a, I have a cynical answer. I think it depends on if you what kind of business you want to have. If you want to manage billions, sure, and that may mean institutions, pensions, whatever. Then, uh, yeah, you're going to say, "Hey, risk-free rate, it's zero now, so uh, five or ten percent return is awesome." But we know CTAs who have twenty vol at least two or three hundred million under management, still making one in twenty, two in twenty, whatever. An incentive fee. They have a great little business. That's their desire to have a nice little business, uh, two or three hundred million with an incentive fee, doing your thing with like minded clients that you've had for a long time. They like you, you like them, they like what you do. Uh, but that's not the path, uh, CTA trend following. Uh, is, that's not a 20 vol, is not the path to billions and billions of AUM. And that is a, addicting. Uh, you don't want to see that money go out the door. You like those management fees. I mean, I think that that. I mean, I think there's a lot of truth to that for sure. But I just wonder what happens when interest rates go back to five or ten percent at some point. Um, you know, do do they have to then change that business model, so to speak? Um, I, 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 you know, it's it's an interesting debate, and I look at it from a slightly maybe more selfish. Uh, point of view because I often hear this thing about, you know, trend following isn't working and et cetera, et cetera. I think maybe we've touched upon this before, but I was I was preparing for a trip to Asia uh, tomorrow. So I was just going through our, our own presentation. I was looking at sort of different uh, returns, our returns over different time frames. And so I look at the full track record since 84. I look at the last sort of 13 years uh, since we started to make some improvements to the model. And I look at the last six years where we made the last major improvement. And actually the annual average returns over those three very distinct periods are almost the same, right? Now what people forget, so, so on one hand I could say, well, you know, Actually, we don't see any degradation of returns. Um, you know, we can still find uh, alpha, even though the risk-free rate of return in the last two of these time frames, are, you know, is close to zero. It's very, it's certainly smaller than from '84 to now. Um, so, if you adjust for that and you add more um, returns, uh, sorry, more more interest in the last few uh, periods of time, then actually you could argue that returns. Are better, so I mean, I know it's not exactly the same, but uh, but it is thing this thing about you know because when I look at the our industry, so the CTA industry is is actually absolutely what what you guys were talking about before. Those returns have gone down significantly, and I'm not saying it's because they've kind of dialed it. Well, they it would have been uh, as Jerry alluded to, 
if the big boys are, are dialing down the returns to manage more assets, then that gets reflected in the indices of the CTA space because they make up those indices for the most part, not the smaller guys like we are. But can we continue to compete if we don't do as you, Moritz, and maybe as we and 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 to some extent you, Jerry? I mean, if we have to deliver some interesting returns, um, you know, to warrant one our fees, our existence, and and so on and so forth. Hmm. And I think there is a, I think there's a need and a desire uh, for more return yeah. and less watering down. And we small CTAs need to don't give in, don't give up and do their thing the way they want to do it and just be patient because things will change and there will be probably a backlash against I'm paying all this money, I'm investing, I'm not getting much in return versus all these smaller type guys. So smaller type guys, may maintain your difference and be there when your time comes where people say, okay, I kind of see it now. It, it all just depends on making money more consistently. Yeah. If, <clears throat> if we kind of just start making money almost every year again, which is what we used to do, uh, a lot of these objections to being small and being different will go away. People will see a benefit in it, I, I think. Mm. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I look at it from uh, from two angles. There's like there's one angle where you're managing money for others and uh, and maybe the clients, your clients, won't be able to, uh, to stomach as much volatility or heat or risk as you as the fund manager can. Okay, so then it's also a business decision because at the end of the day, we need to serve that client and make sure that, you know, uh, we're having a good, good time together, delivering good returns. But then the other angle is like the way I look at that when I manage my private sovereign wealth fund here is um, I have a limited time span on that planet. And, you know, I'm putting in all that work, researching systems, putting trades in, speaking to brokers, spending time, you know, uh, working on research, system evolution, all of that type of stuff. At the end of the day, I also want to get paid for that. If, if I traded that at 5 vol and say my sharp ratio is 0.5, they're making 2.5% per year on average, right? But then there's fees and commissions and stuff. And, you know, so this is not, this is not going to be moving the needle all too much. And I could then as well say, you know, let's just be dumb about this and, you know, purchase a basket of corporate bonds and some equities and just, you know, go, go for the ride. We don't know. We don't like that. But really for for that, you know, to pay out and to be compensated and, and, you know, also, you know, make the money that I want to be making from that system, I need to be trading that at higher vol. And there's just no way I'm going to be trading it at five. That, that's just not making the money that I want to be making with it. I think you made a great point there, more. It's about, you know, who do you really want as your client and, and who are you trading for? Um, it reminds me of a podcast I heard this week. Um, I think it was from uh, Patrick Ostrana says, uh, invest like the best. And he's interviewing this guy who uh, invests his fund is Iraqi stocks. I mean, so so he talks about, and, and I'm paraphrasing and, and it definitely needs some fact checking uh, for what I'm about to say. But he was basically uh, looking for a sort of the, the, the least light type of investment that he couldn't think about back in 2007 when he wanted to start his, his fund. And he came up with the Iraqi stocks as probably the worst thing that you could, uh, you could find, but also where you could have some transformational returns, really something that would move the needle if you get it right. But what he said, and, and I apologize, I don't remember his name, but, but what he said was so true because he said, I knew back then that I would never be able to raise money from institutional investors because they would, you know, people who are investing money uh, on uh, on behalf of others would never want to show up at an investment committee meeting and having to explain, oh, so why did you lose 33% in Iraqi stocks last quarter? I mean, it just wouldn't happen, right? So, um, so he knew his client base had to be people who were the owner of the money, so to speak, you know, the head of the family office, all the private individual. And I think that makes sense. And to a certain extent, and maybe Jerry, uh, you you have an opinion about this. But but back in the day when when you and I at least started in this industry, you know, a lot of money really came from the high net worth individuals, right? There, it wasn't really 
institutional grade type uh, investors that we would cater for, except with a few exceptions in the sovereign wealth uh, land where, again, it was their money. But it became over time much more institutional. And, and there's a very high correlation, in, uh, as, as far as I can tell, between the transition of clients uh, or to the change of client landscape to the change of volatility that, that these products are now being sold with. Um, so I think that's a really important and dominant factor. And maybe, maybe it's not a bad thing to be different on that front as well and say, well, you know, we don't mind 20 vol. Um, but it also means our client base will be somewhat different to, um, to other managers. And I see that on our side. I would say that our client base is different to some of the, uh, the multi-billion dollar shops. Um, and, and, and that's great because we need both, right? We, we, we need, or, and investors need uh, to be able to, to choose. I've often said, you know, that uh, when I would go in and talk to institutions, it just seemed to me that uh, I probably had a better chance of getting an investment from the five people in the room <laughs> personally, yeah. rather than them recommending, being even able to recommend uh, an investment, you know, going through their rules and their the way that they chose managers, I probably wasn't going to fit in. Uh, but each individual person in the room kind of liked me and probably would have, you know, put money in the mutual fund or the LP or whatever. So it's kind of sad. I think a lot of the institutions are getting themselves into situations where they're not even able to invest uh, in the best, uh, even if it's a small amount, because the manager doesn't look like so-and-so. Yeah. But uh, I think Moritz made an amazing point. And since I'm older than you guys, it really hit home. And that is, it's your life and you have some time on this earth and how are you going to spend it? And I don't even think it's always about money. You know, it's like, I have a, I I like your point though, that, you know, I want to make this money and uh, why should I spend my wheels when I'm not, it's not very profitable, but but also you get into situations where you're asked to do certain things or have or change your firm around and you're like in the end after you've been doing it for a long time, like, oh, yeah, that's not the sort of legacy or what I should have been spending my time doing from a qualitative point of view either. So I think always be thinking about that. And if you end up with, you know, moderate wealth and uh, but a business you can really be proud of and one that has a long history and a long track record of you continuing to do what you thought was right the whole time, I think that it's going to go a long ways for you saying at the end of the day, I spent my time well. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I completely agree with that. I just want to add one small comment, and that is, of course, as we see the industry, you know, as, as we're suspecting at least, uh, choosing low and lower of all for their strategies and therefore being able to deliver low and lower returns and are delivering low and lower returns as an industry at least, at the same time, we're still only seeing the industry being used with a five percent allocation as "quote unquote" the crisis alpha. So we're going to even we're going to produce even less "quote unquote" crisis alpha because, as an industry, where we have lower leverage and we're not getting twenty-five or thirty percent of the pie, we're still getting the same five percent we did ten years ago, if if at all. Um, so it's even a worse situation, I think, for. For those institutions who um, who choose um, or who prefer uh, this, you know, very low vol solution when it comes to trend following or or managed futures, that was a long um, comment to one tweet. Do you have any more tweets, Yeah. Yeah, well, it's kind of funny because they're building on each other. Um, this one's sort of similar, and, and it comes from Mark at Discipline Systematic Global Macro Views, one of our favorite uh, people, yeah. also. And he sort of like almost follows up by saying, um, I quote this on a tweet, a dirty secret for hedge funds is that investors don't want hedges during big stock market up moves. They want performance. Underperformance during large market beta moves requires an explanation. <laughs> Explain to me why you didn't make as much money when you have currencies, commodities, and interest rates, and you have some shorts. <laughs> right. And I just sarcastically write at the end, explanation or new clients. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, you can't always have this excuse. Well, I have bad clients. I need new clients. I mean, uh, some of them are not bad. And, uh, you can't keep making that as an excuse. But I think it is interesting that uh, it's not even a, a secret. You know, we all have this 
human failing. They're bashing phones and keyboards too when their alts don't keep up with the stock market. Yeah. And maybe we're back just back to this uh, kind of same uh, challenge that we live under where, um, you know, where people look at monthly returns, quarterly returns, and it's all about that similar to when big companies who are trying to make decisions for the next 10 years still have to meet quarterly, um, you know, earnings calls, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, um, the the investment horizon that uh, models that we run uh, are just not suited for, uh, you know, frequent uh, evaluation. Um, and I guess that's where private equity is such a beautiful invention because there you don't have to um, deliver that. You lock people up for 10 years and you come back and, and then, and then you look at the result uh, ten years later, and of course, we know that would be a perfect solution for for things that we do. On the other hand, we have also, as an industry, uh, shown that you know being liquid and sometimes having to be used as as the ATM, so to speak, um, is a very valid uh, and and valuable uh, attribution that we have, even though. I don't think we get a lot of credit for it, uh, so to speak, um, because being liquid and also then producing above average returns are usually not things that go hand in hand. Um, but um, but at least that's what we're trying to do. What do you think, Moritz? Yeah, I, I, I couldn't be adding anything to that. I think that is all correct. Mm. So where? Uh, let's keep, keep uh, going. Keep with Wayne. He's... Yeah. He's quite amazing, smart guy. I think, you know, Wayne reminds me of, we talked about uh, Mar Howard Marks. We all like Howard and we are able to get into those um, memos that he publishes and pull out of that, uh, this wisdom that we have no problem applying to systematic trend following, even though he doesn't trade systematic trend following and probably has talked bad about it. Well, I'll forgive him for that. <laughs> but I don't think Wayne um, is a trend follower either, let's say. But it's just the wisdom is uh, there's some commonalities of successful trading that he that uh, is in his philosophy and ours. And he tweets, uh, when assessing probabilities of an investment or trade, be sure to add the most important component that sits right outside of the measurement, the consequences of being wrong. Mm -hmm. Lower probability with minor consequences outperforms higher probability with drastic consequences. So there you have it, um, a less than 50% success rate with uh, stop losses and taking small losses, to be more precise, doesn't have to be stop loss, um, is uh, better than the opposite. And I comment on this by saying stop losses can make you invincible, which is not 100% true, let's say. I kind of uh, messed that up. So. I don't think you should ever look at anything, oh, I, now I'm invincible, quote unquote. Uh, so stop losses doesn't make you invincible, but it does really help and uh, keep you out of some trouble. Taking small losses was uh, my addition to this very profound statement. Yeah, absolutely. What are your thoughts, uh, Moritz? Uh, it's a superstar quote by, by Wayne. I really like that. I retweeted that also. Maybe also, you know, I think I, I also like the invincible uh, uh, part, Jerry. Um, you know, of course, you know, yeah, invincible and in, quote unquote invincible. But, you know, this is what we do. We always need to have that stop in so that we can play another day just in case we're wrong. And we're wrong most of the time. I'm wrong most of the time. So, you know, it's, it's part of that protective armor that uh, we all need to wear. Um, to be able to to live in these markets and and you know not being kicked out, but it's just you know what amazes me time and time again is the way that Wayne is able to you know phrase those um, phrase that wisdom and then put it into words. It's uh, it's just fantastic. I, I wouldn't be able to come up with that uh, in in that way. So really, uh, kudos to him for that. And being invincible or the feeling of, of being invincible, I'm, you know, I wouldn't put it down to just, you know, the stop losses as, as such. Um, and, and I say that because uh, a lot of the emails that I started out by commenting and, and, and thanking people for giving us all this feedback, which, which we get. And, and I truly mean that it is super, super helpful for us to, 
to get it. Um, but I remember that um, certainly through last, in, you know, last year was a rough year for for all of us. Uh, maybe with the exception of you, Moritz, you did well, but but for the industry at least, you know, we had some 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 fairly steep drawdowns, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the comments that came, you know, over and over again from many sources was really when they listened to us talk, uh, we all sounded pretty calm about it. And I think that that quote unquote calmness slash invincibility, I think it doesn't come, at least not in my case, it doesn't come just from, you know, uh, having stop losses or, or something that, you know, mirrors being, you know, a stop loss, however you define your rules. But it is the rules. And I remember our conversation, uh, Jerry, with uh, with Richard Dennis, where he ended up saying that, you know, uh, I think, you know, something like, you know, as much as the trend is your friend, uh, the rules really are your guardian angel. And I think that is so, that, that to me is the essence of invincibility. It's the set of rules uh, that we apply with this laser focus uh, in terms of discipline. Um, you know, because the stop loss is part of it, but but there's a lot more that goes into the to the pie uh, as we bake up our trend following uh, approaches, and that gives us the confidence, and that exactly. confidence then translates into the quote unquote invincibility. That's right. That's right. Yeah, you're 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 so right. Everything about trend following is is about risk control, and all along the way, as we add the markets and the shorts. Uh, and the stop losses and the trailing stops and only paying attention to price. Uh, we are never giving up uh, the potential for the profit. It's no, it's, we're not detracting ever. So it really, you can't even uh, figure out where, where does the profit making start and the, what part of what we do is profit, what part is risk control. It's like all risk controls all combined together. You can't even pull it apart. Um, and then I would say that the opposite of what Wayne said, or of what my comment about uh, the small losses is true as well. There is nothing to help you. You are alone. You're in a bad situation uh, when you miss a big trend. So don't even think about doing the trade. I mean, well, you have your rules, let's say, but if you're thinking, you know, put the trade on. It's not even a question, but it's the high of the day. I missed it. I should have bought it yesterday. All these excuses we've mm -hmm. talked about. No, you're fine. You're golden. You've got, you're going to take a small loss. You're going to risk 25 bips, 50 bips, whatever it is. And it's one of many different positions, one of many longs or one of many shorts. Uh, it's an easy decision to make. Put your pride aside. But you have nothing to help you, nothing to guard against missing that trade. Putting the trade on, you're, you're okay. You take a small loss. The only thing will be hurt would be your pride. Yes. So I think that's very important. And Exits have more uh, differences, you know, when you exit now or later, the P&L on, P on this nice big trend will be larger or smaller. But to some degree, the entries are really what we need to concentrate on just as much. Sure, sure. Very exciting uh, what you can get from a 140 character mm -hmm. tweet. Anything else, um, Jerry, that you felt was really cool this week? Yeah, I think uh, sticking with Mark again, um, I just sat at my computer yesterday and just in like an hour, just over and over reading great stuff that he puts out. Um, this is a concept that I liked. It didn't get uh, maybe 10 likes, but I like. I thought it was worth more. Um, it, you know, he, he sort of talks about how it's important. Uh, he has a study that, or something that he's done or he's quoting other studies where he talks about um, multiple systems, multiple entries, multiple exits, ensemble modeling is what he calls it, how important it is in time frame diversification, uh, the look back periods, you know, uh, 100 day moving average, a 200 day moving average, a 300 day moving average, you know, something like that. He talks about how that's um, very beneficial to performance and risk um, because even though we care about following a system and sort of sucking it up when the volatility is high or the drawdowns are high. It's not like we don't care. We would prefer that not to happen. And we can get some relief with multiple entries and exits and lookbacks. And then uh, one of the things I thought, the very, the very end, he goes, there is value with being a model craftsman. And I think that's our response usually when we say to people, um, well, why, or people say to us, like, 
I could just buy an ETF. I can just do my own trend following. I can just do my own thing because all trend following is equal. You know, there's, it's a commodity. It's, it deserves uh, no incentive fee, et cetera. But at the end of the day, what this craftsmanship, this 30, 40 years of building something, making it slightly better all the time is worth, has value. Mm -hmm. And I like to look at myself as a model craftsman. I really like that. Um, it matters these little improvements that we've gone through hell to figure out over the years. Isn't it uh, Robert Greene or, some, or someone um, with a similar name who wrote the big, uh, the book about mastery that it takes you at least 10,000 hours to become a master of something? And and I think that's very true. I mean, sure, you can get a head start by uh, reading books and listening to podcasts, et cetera, et cetera. But before you really get down to the nitty gritty of things, which is also why I sometimes take the the view that not everyone should be spending their time trying to become their own trend follower. I mean, I think sometimes it makes more sense for people to just find a few trend followers to invest with rather than doing it themselves because there is a cost to achieving uh, the um, the level of of skill that the the firms and strategies that we represent uh i mean it didn't just come as an overnight success um so um so i think that's an important point as well for sure i agree with that i think you know we're all i mean don't don't anybody get this the wrong way but we're all kind of like artists with our model craftsmen right and those models um they develop over time and you know nobody is born and just paints like picasso other than picasso but probably he also goes through, you know, stages where his paintings get better and his skills get better. And the same is true with those models. I mean, you start with a very simple idea, you're reading books, you're getting it, or maybe you think you get it and you don't actually get it, but then you you actually have to you have to do it. You have to build those models and see what they do for you and how they work. And you get more efficient with building models. You get quicker with testing things. Your skills improve over time with every year. You see more of that stuff. You're also able to just say no to things uh, when they cross your mind and you think, well, that's cool, but you really know, no, that's not cool. So just don't go down that rabbit hole. So it's kind of like this artsy thing. I, I really agree with that, which we all have in our models because none of us trade exactly in the same way, which means there is no such thing as the trend following. There's, yeah, trend following systems by different types of people working in similar but yet different ways. And it's all an expression of, you know, how we look at the markets, how we want to trade them, how we see risk and and how we go about that. So it's all kind of like, in a way, this artistic individual work of a person that shines through at the end of the day in the time series reflecting your performance. And I would just add to that, Moritz, um, because you're absolutely right, um, but I would add to that, it also takes uh, a period of time, sometimes years, to then build up the confidence to blindly follow your system after you've done all that work. I mean, because that's part of this, the secret to su success is that you don't, you don't uh, deviate away from uh, from what you've built, even when it goes through the the tough times. But uh, yeah, very true. Wayne had a tweet a few weeks ago. I can't find it, but it was something along those lines about uh, creativity. And uh, I really liked it. And uh, you need to put yourself in a situation where you can be creative, which reminds me of another tweet. I think uh, something about... Um, being a, being underemployed, you know, so you're not working in a, in a spreadsheet or in your code all the time, but you're able to kind of have this uh, creativity and expression and uh, try to uncover some of the big ideas and big principles. And so I think that's, you know, obviously very important. That's what I see myself as too, is more of a creative type person, understanding the pros and cons of ideas you're looking at. And then I know I retweeted, uh, my comment on one of the retweets was, then you hand it to the coders, you know, and I meant to sort of be dismissive of coding, you know, it's kind of like, but just in a joking way, you know, they're, they're very important, but I think that's how you want to go about it. The kind of creative uh, people who see it from uh, the experience and it see it from a very high level. And now we think this might work. Now let's give it to the coding people. 
I think that's how it works best for trend following anyways. Yeah. No, no. You're, you're very, you're very right there. Any, um, any other tweets? I liked another yeah. one. I really liked, um, maybe a week or two old, but we didn't get a chance to get to it was uh, one from Moritz, which was, um, George, who we brought this to my attention and, uh, spruced it up a little bit. And George is uh, another guy who's a big supporter of the podcast and gives us lots of good questions and, um, encouragement. He, it goes like this. I think we all agree that what we need is a broad brush. I've never been too good with a sharp pencil parentheses, high precision rules on trading systems. And I think that's a quote from Moritz and I really liked it. And, uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, in, 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 we are sort of doing our own thing and we all, uh, this is what makes us all kind of successful is that even though we're doing our own thing to some degree, we're not, what's really uh, the core of what we do, the trend and the diversification really uh, keeps us all kind of being still somewhat similar. Yeah. You know, coming back to what we just talked about with uh, the craftsmanship of, of the model, right? I mean, 20 years ago, I wanted to have that sharp pencil. You know, I was sitting in front of the computer and I was, you know, sharpening that thing up and I really wanted to, you know, get every basis point out of that system. And I've probably curved it, you know, far too much, over-optimized it because this is how I thought I should be going about markets. You know, how about I create that smooth line? And then you take some time and you go like, well, no, that's, it, it just doesn't work that way. You can do the back test. Yes, that will work. But none of that will work in practice. And that is also the, the very first and most important thing that I've learned is that put that sharp pencil away. It's it's not what I can bring uh, uh, in terms of performance. I need that broad brush. I need a robust system that works over many, many different markets in exactly the same way, long and short, without the sharp pencil. But maybe it's also because it's a little bit counterintuitive, right? Because we use math, we use rules, we're quants, right? And and mm. math usually only has one result that is correct, right? So you're you're looking for that correct answer and what we're saying is actually in trend following there isn't one correct answer it's a it's a broad brush approach it's uh you know good enough is good enough <laughs> try and tell that to your math teacher um oh, i got close you know you wouldn't get many you know points for that so um so there's a little bit of counterintuitiveness in my opinion to the fact that um we use these um you know tools that generally just uh, gives it would give you one accurate result. Yet we're saying, well, it doesn't have to be that way. And I don't think it works that way in financial markets in general. I mean, this is you know what are markets? It's a it's a marketplace where humans come together with their emotions and they buy and sell, or they program machines and codes and systems to to buy and sell automatically in a systematic way. But at the end of the day, this is a really unpredictable, uh, chaotic system. Um, and yes, we can use statistical analysis to find some patterns and, you know, things that work uh, in general, but um, I, I don't think financial markets lend themselves to the, the mathematical school of here is the one correct answer and I have that answer and therefore I know it's true or false and I'm going to do the trade. It's It's not that way. Everything we do has this massive amount of massive degree of uncertainty always connected to it all the trades that we have on every one of those trades could be a bad trade bad in quotes the right trade to do but the outcome could be bad it's one of the things we can't control so it's you know i'm just i don't i don't see myself as a mathematician um super quant looking at looking at markets i'm just using the numbers and the stats and the outcomes of a test and you know thinking of what makes sense how broad does that brush have to be but there's no you know formula uh, that gives me the end result i mean if if that were the case then um <laughs> maybe we wouldn't have that podcast mm -hmm. the trend following is systematic uh, requires that uh, it w in order to be successful it requires you uh, to do your trades. Uh, the entry and the exit are linked together. Uh, we never exit uh, a trade <clears throat> and say, well, that one's over. Uh, and uh, now I know to be out of the market. You do know 
on that particular system, entry, exit, inextricably linked to each other. But you may even have more positions on with different exits. So you're not even making a call like now's the time to get in or out. It's just all probabilities. And it's sort of goofy that it, uh, I can't look at your trades. You know, if you're a superior trader, I don't, I can't even desire. Uh, well, I wish I knew what those positions were. I wish I knew where he got in. Where is he going to get out? This guy is really a great trader. Uh, no, it, it requires you to have success. It requires you to do your trades every single time. Mm-hmm. That's the only way you're going to get success. Not mine, not someone else's, but your own. It's really unique, I think, in the way we look at the markets and the way that when you adopt a systematic approach, the way you're sort of forced into to dealing with all of this. It's quite contrary to what we hear in media a lot. Uh, Where's the market going? This is why it's going a certain way and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I think that's that's uh, absolutely uh, spot on. Uh, how did the Twitter story continue, Jerry? Um, do you have more you want to bring up? Oh, well, let's just uh, end with this one uh, that... Um, yeah. A lot of people liked, I'm not even sure if I know exactly what is meant by it, but it sort of says that saying that trend following doesn't work because it's crowded is probably hiding the fact that there's no trends in the first place. That's certainly what I've been saying for a while, that uh, I'm not adverse to evidence uh, by any means that trend following doesn't work or it's in a different period now, but uh, we've got to get beyond uh, this period of no trends or very few trends that has nothing to do with trend following or being overcrowded, then we can evaluate, uh, you know, are we getting, are we having more losses, more false breakouts to the upside downside? And we're just taking more losses. Are we, when we get the big trends like uh, <clears throat> palladium and hogs and emissions, uh, we stay in them for a year or two or six months and then they crash. We get very little money out of it anymore. Uh, so that's why I was very interested in those three trades this week and continuing to monitor them. Uh, although alone, they won't tell us very much, but at some point in time, if everything crashes, you know, we make very little money. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with facing those facts, but let's get some trends first. I mean, I think that's true. And of course, uh, from the few tweets I sent out this week, of course, the one that got the most uh, reaction was when I was uh, saying that uh, you and I, Jerry, had... Uh, a good debate last week regarding this whole point about crowdedness and so on and so forth. Of course, in a completely friendly manner, um, but um, but I think that is actually a very important point that you bring up, and that is, it goes back to my point about evaluation timeframes, right? You know, we look at things over a month, over a quarter, over a year, even five years, and and of course we see articles about you know a decade of underperformance of trend followers, et cetera, et cetera. But in the big scheme of things, I mean, even a decade you know, you can certainly have a decade where there are fewer trends uh, and where all the action happens in in one particular part of, of, of the portfolio. But similarly, you know, let's not forget that, that equity markets can go through a decade without any returns. Uh, and, and as, as Moritz uh, brought up a, a few months ago, I mean, I think the it's the Italian stock market or something like that that has had now 25 years of no return. Um, and we can, of course, look at Japan, which peaked in 1989. That's that's a pretty long time since making a new high. So, yeah, I mean, I agree completely that uh, we can't really say anything about these things until we um, we get a you know a period of time where where there is objectively lots of trends around. Then we'll see if trend following still works. And like I said uh, before we went on, you know, um, it was very uh, humbling and embarrassing that my basketball team was the first one to lose a number one seed to a to the lowest seed. And yet right. uh, they now say to themselves that, you know, we handled it correctly. You know, now we're the national champions. Uh, we handled that incredible adversity and we didn't want it to happen in the but uh, maybe it, it helped us and we learned some things. So when we come out of this, you know, and we get back to more normal period where there are more trends, there are more interest rates are more normal and uh, <clears throat> the trends in, in lots of different markets, then let's be, let's have learned our lesson. Let's say, okay, we didn't like that period. I wish it hadn't have happened, 
but I'm not so sure that the great period we will eventually experience would have been as great if we hadn't have gone back and been humbled and done more research and understood what was important, got away from the things that were not important, and were really prepared due to going through these valley experiences. Every single business book uh, that I've ever come across and every time you hear people who are incredibly successful uh, on a podcast or in an interview of some sort and they talk about, you know, so what has been the most important thing in your life? They all say, I think, um, it's, you know, it's the failures. It's the failures that you learn uh, from and, and, and so on and so forth. And I'm not necessarily saying, you know, a period without trends is a failure, but it's the difficult times for sure that we go through as as an industry. Um, and that's where, you know, often real innovation uh, is happening. I mean, when there are lots of trends around, everybody's making money and and it's it's hard to see whether that's luck or skill, really. Um, and um, but when when things are tough and 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 you have to really go back and and look at that uh, broad brush uh, approach and see if it's still valid, I mean, I think that's where real uh, innovation and and improvements come to uh, to what we do. Uh, I don't think this industry is any different from from any other in that respect. Can we really say that what we see? right here, right now, are difficult times. You know, I hear people say it's it's difficult, it's a difficult time for trend following. And yeah, of course, you know, perf- you know performance uh, speaks about that or speaks to that. But it's also that recency bias. You know, we as humans find it so easy to look back for the last two, three, five, ten years because we still have our memory fresh with the events that happened. And in the last 10 years, we've seen central banks throwing cash at everything, every problem that just, you know, comes up, there's, there's a solution provided by central banks. And, and then we say, well, that's not normal, that's difficult, that's, um, that's bad for us. But really then, you know, when you, when you go back decades and decades and decades to the 1920s, 1930s, interest rates were exactly pretty much where they are today. Um, central banks behaved in similar ways, don't want to say identical, but, you know, environments were like that, like central banks really fighting uh, economic slowdown. And, you know, there have been so many periods in the past, which, you know, we haven't lived through, I wasn't even born, oil embargoes, wars, things like that, maybe those periods have been just as difficult as the one that we see right now. And so I kind of like, I don't, I don't like it to say that, this is such a difficult period. It's just a market period, um, which just, you know, ends up not producing the trends that we want, you know, that, that we say got used to in, in earlier times. But maybe that's just the necessary period that, um, you know, in which there's all that pressure building up, uh, you know, all the debt building up, all the central bank activity, and then maybe in a couple of uh, maybe months, weeks, years, who knows, there's this little valve where it all needs to go through and, and, and we'll have great times. I don't, I, I don't know if that's going to happen. Maybe it will not happen. It's a possibility there. But um, I, many times I just hear people talking about difficult times. I just find them complaining about the right here, right now without the longer term perspective. And there have been multiple periods where Markets have been just as distorted, if you will, or crazy, whatever you want to call it, as they are today. That's true, uh, Moritz. And I don't mean it as an excuse when I use the word that it's difficult. I mean, I I think that there are a couple of things you can say. One is, as I mentioned earlier on, when I look at our own returns over different time frames, in fact, they're exactly the same, uh, you know, for the last five years and 10 years or so than they have been for the last 35 years. So in that respect, um, I'm not complaining, I'm not saying it as an excuse. Um, but on the other hand, if I look at, you know, shorter term timeframes, for example, 2018, when I objectively look at that, nothing to do with a particular model, just trying to measure trendiness as I do, uh, as you know, with my trend barometer, I can see from those set of rules completely objectively, that there were fewer trends around. Um, I also remember going back in time that there has certainly been periods where there's been a lot of, you could call it trading range compression, meaning that those trends that were there, they, they were they were shorter, they were smaller. So, 
so no, you're right. I mean, we shouldn't use it as as an excuse. Um, I think we, um, or at least for for my own sake, I use it as a as a measure of trying to explain that there are certain environments that are good for trend following. There are certain environments that are challenging for trend following. Just like, as you said, there are certain environments that are good for equities. There are certain environments that are bad for equities. It, that's absolutely true. And, and we should, you know, we shouldn't use it as an excuse. I think the reason why it is being used as, as an excuse is because investor timeframes have compressed as well. So unless you are trying to really um, explain to them why 2018 was a horrible year for any time frame of trend following, but also for many other asset classes, and they kind of accept and buy into that, well, they may say, well, trend following doesn't work anymore. We're we going to move on, which we all know is the absolute worst time um, to do something like that. Um, and I think that's why it often comes up. But I am interested in, and that is that is true. It is interesting to see that a lot of people, um, you know, tend to use it as an excuse for their own um, performance. That That is interesting, I think. I think it uh, reminds me of uh, <clears throat> situations I had when I first started trading and there would just be no real tolerance for having an emotional opinion. And I saw if it hits home to me what you were saying, Moritz. And uh, I think it sort of reminds me too, is where we first started this conversation today. Okay. So complaining and thinking about this stuff in kind of that way, 10 years, stocks, clients, it's not breaking phones, but it's getting awfully close to uh, what is ruling you today, dispassionate belief <clears throat> in the work you've done and the numbers and the back test and the, the approach you have, <clears throat> are we going to, and so I think it's sort of, I got to watch myself. I agree. I need to not have that mentality. It's not quite throwing phones and getting angry, but it's still too much emotion in it. For, so I'm going to watch myself. And it's not just us, uh, you know, or to say that the CTA group. I mean, I think it, it's, it's, everyone's that way. You know, you hear the value people speak about, well, that's uh, been a bad six, seven years for value stocks because the growth stocks are um, running the show. And there's always, there's, you know, no matter what investment strategy there is, there's always an investment strategy that, you know, underperforms relative to another one. And then it's so easy to say, well, you know, the environment is difficult for that one. And uh, it's not my fault. Of course, you know, it's not, your fault that the environment is that way but it's you know uh, it's 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 a set of cards that you've been dealt and uh, you have to deal with them and you've probably be you know there there will be periods where you get better cards and worse cards and it will just happen and you know again and again this is how i see it um and i'm not giving up that there will be um periods where we will have absolutely great performance. And I'm already looking forward to those. Yeah, I mean, so do, so do I. But I mean, I, and I, but I think it, it, I mean, at the end of the day, um, we all need to get better at just owning it, right? I mean, we just need to, to, to own that yes. situation we're in. Um, and if we believe in what we do, I, and I know the three of us do, but I mean, if we do, then we should be able to, express and uh, radiate that confidence uh, to our uh, surroundings, including our clients. And hopefully that will guide them to stick with it because the compound, the benefit of the compound rate of return doesn't come in three years or five years. It comes after 20 years or 30 years. Um, and in those 20, 30, 40 years, there will be, of course, times where it's not working uh, as well as we would like, but it doesn't mean it doesn't work. And then we, I like to remind myself that one of the great features of following trends is that things that have never happened before, we can make money. You know, we can short crude at 90 and it goes down to 20. No one is expecting it. We had gone short four or five times before that in a six month period, but then all of a sudden it goes, we don't pay attention, uh, to that sort of th the reasoning and the fundamentals. So we're just going to always be there with the right position eventually in something that occurs uh, in this world that's unprecedented. Okay, so take the good with the bad. It's unprecedented that we have extended periods of losses. Eh, that's life. We've got nothing to change. We can improve, but probably not due to that period. 
one of the things that, you know, um, help helps me. And this is, this is because of Tom Basso, a trend following trader, but I, um, you know, he's like, if you're in a drawdown, if you have those bad weeks, bad days, bad month, uh, the trades don't work, the equity curve is going down to keep an even keel, uh, you know, force yourself to remember better days, days where you were full of joy, excited, how quickly you're making the money, you know, successive up days and how you felt when that happened and vice versa. If you have those days where just everything works, right? All the trades work, uh, you're making a percent day, day after day, you know, don't freak out about it. You know, remember that there will again be periods the darker periods, you know, weeks and months and years where you'll find it so difficult. There's only headwind, no tailwind. And, you know, this is, I, you know, I have that like a little note on my desk, you know, keep that balance. It's just, you know, the tide coming in, come going out. You have to swim with that. And there's the two sides of that coin. Um, and maybe that's a tip, but it, it does help me to kind of like reflect on, periods in the past where I've been, you know, we're, we're, we're trading systems, but we're not robots. So we, you know, we, we, we do have emotions with, with the results that we're obtaining, but it's just one of the things that is helpful to me um, in you know, keeping the balance there. Just hearing you say that more, it makes me feel better just now. So maybe we should in include a new segment in our weekly podcast called Moritz's Minute of Mindset. You know, that would be uh, fantastic. Yes, I like. I agree. It is a, it's a mental game, right? I mean, we talk about it so much, but it's the mindset. At the end of the day, that's what uh, you have to... Uh, you have to have that in check uh, to win in this game and, and, and in other investment strategies. So I think it's important we shouldn't... You shouldn't underestimate that. It's very important. Uh, I think uh, it's underestimated. I think you were always saying to people, don't have those feelings, which may be not be good advice. It's like, okay, you have these feelings. Let's, how are we going to deal with this? And uh, there's a favorite Wall Street um, show here. And I don't know if you guys get Showtime and Billions. Mm. It's like the best show on TV and it's hedge funds and it's crazy hedge fund guides. Of course we get it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So um, it's really popular here. And then yeah. one of the star characters is the woman who's in charge of uh, everyone's mental health. The coach. Yeah. And I think that some of the, I heard of this over the years at some of the larger hedge funds and bah, just dismiss that, you know, buck up, don't be so wimpy. But I think that's wrong. I think you, it, it, there, there's a lot going on there. And uh Something I haven't explored, but I think uh, it makes a lot of sense. I often hear when I listen to Tony Robbins, of course, uh, probably the number one coach in the world. Um, he always says that uh, for the last 23 years, every day, he's been talking to Paul Tudor Jones. And since he started working him, with him, he hasn't had a down year since. Um, so like the uh, tweet, I think that, uh, uh, or the quote, I think it was from... Uh, uh, Jesse Felder, when he joined our show, I mean, if it's good enough for Paul Tudor Jones, it's good enough for me. <laughs> and coaching is a great thing, you know, not only for traders, I think, you know, not many traders probably do it. And, you know, I, I count myself among them. I don't have a professional coach like, you know, Bobby Axelrod in Billions or, you know, the guys working for him. So, you know, I get the coaching through conversations like with you guys, you know, with other people, you know, just exchanging thoughts about markets, you know, not being alone, but, you know, sharing the experiences uh, and, you know, uh, what you see out there in the markets with others. Um, but it's not only traders. I just, you know, earlier this week listened to, um, to a podcast, uh, the, the, the Tim Ferriss Show, and he's got Eric Schmidt on, the former CEO of Google. And uh, so he's on that show telling that, you know, they all get coaching. Steve Jobs at Apple got coaching from, you know, this guy. I'm drawing a blank on his name. Eric Schmidt, the people at Novell, at Sun Microsystems, they have, they have people coming in and coaching them on how to run a business at a certain point in time, given the amount of people that employ, given how fast they grow and, you know, how they need to communicate that, how they need to keep the internal balance to have, you know, cohesiveness with a team so that nobody feels, feels overruled. You know, it's, it's kind of, it's a different type of coaching, but at the same time, it's, it's also very similar because it's, 
it's so important to be mindful of how you approach the markets, how you approach your business, how you approach your employees, and, and how to work with that and manage that for your own good. And if you're just there for yourself, then that may be more difficult. I mean, this, I think this is such an important point uh, and, and topic. We could, uh, you know, have a very long discussion about this. I just want to remind uh, uh, you, Moritz and, and Jerry, that before we uh, we went on air today, we were actually discussing, uh, based on some feedback, the length of our, uh, you know, weekly podcast, whether it was too long uh, uh, or whether it wasn't long enough, et cetera, et cetera. And we all said, oh, let's try and keep it to an hour. That's a good length. And of course... Here we are, one hour and 15 minutes into it. And if we just get so engaged in our conversation, we kind of forget that we also have to be mindful of uh, of the time. So actually, I would say we're not even come to the questions uh, this week, but I would encourage people to give us some feedback, uh, send us some emails, info at toptradersandplug.com. Tell us whether you think we're, you know, is it too long, an hour and a half? Is it too short? Is, you know, is one hour better than we, we just want to understand better from you how we can serve you. Um, but, but clearly we, uh, you know, we, we get, you know, we get incredibly passionate about these topics. So we just uh, wander off and, and, and forget about these things uh, from time to time. So, but maybe with that in mind, maybe we should uh, move on to our last uh, usual segment and just take a couple of questions uh, this week to uh, to honor that side of things uh, as well. Let's do it. Uh, let's do it. So um, this is not, I, th- I think, is, I'm not entirely sure this is a question, but I want to acknowledge uh, Jim who sent us uh, a link from a, an article from Alpha Architect um, uh, headed uh, trend following a decade of underperformance and I don't think we wanted to go into the details of the um, of how they conduct this. I think we've already talked about that there obviously are different ways of looking at these uh, things, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it is clearly some of the headlines we often uh, encounter, even though you can find uh, examples of uh, trend followers who are not underperforming uh, in the last decade. But we appreciate uh, you, Jim, for sending us uh, this article, making us aware of it. And and to everyone listening, I mean, if you see something you think is really relevant that you want us to to comment on, we will certainly do so. So keep keep your questions and comments coming uh, by, by all means. Now, there is a question, though, coming from John. John had uh, a couple of questions for us last week, I think it was. So... We appreciate you, John, as well. Um, this is about uh, roles. So John wants to get a little bit of uh, feedback from us in terms of uh, how we deal with roles. So from one futures contract to the next. Um, and, um, and, and he goes, um, example one, let's say your system gives a signal to go long or short uh, and it's a couple of weeks before the front month expires. Uh, question one, would you automatically just enter into the front month or would roll for, or would you roll forward into the next contract, especially since most of the time volume and open interest is being is beginning to decline in the front month? Uh, example two, um, let's use the current live cattle market as an example, since I know livestock has been uh, good to you, gents, so far this year. Uh, so uh, your long live cattle, the April contract rolls to June in early April before delivery period. At the end of March, the June contract has begun to decline in price a bit. Therefore, the question is, uh, if, you're already in a, if you're already in a position and the expiration is near, do you just roll forward long automatically, no matter the fill price, or would you wait for a better fill opportunity in a declining market when uh, then continue your long position? So I think we get the gist of that question. Thanks, John, for that. Um, Moritz, do you have a, a few uh, words about how you... Uh, deal with roles. I think we're probably all more or less at the same page. So maybe your your answer will deal with it. I, I have a role schedule. Uh, so for every market that I trade, um, I've defined uh, rules on, on how to roll uh, those markets. And I certainly review the rules um, and, and the volume in the markets to find out if, you know, the patterns have changed, if, you know, uh, you know, people started rolling in and out of a contract earlier than 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 what I thought, but so I have those rules, and um, you know that that rule tells me there's a certain date uh, in a month 
uh, as in relation to the upcoming first notice or last trade date of the contract uh, on which I will roll. And I respect that date. So even if I get a signal um, the day prior to that date, um, and you may think that's inefficient, but that's the way my system works, I will roll. I will, I will take the signal, open a position in a contract, and then if my roll date is on the next day, I will do the roll on the next day. Yeah, I'll just add one thing, John, to that. And uh, by no, we're not sponsored or, or have any incentive to mention these guys. But there is a data service called CSI that uh, produce some really reliable um, end of day data, I think, at reasonable prices. And in that system, there are uh, rules you can apply to how you want to handle your roles. So you can do like, um, you can you can set it up and saying, you know, for example, for live cattle, I want to roll you know, uh, three days into the month before uh, of the contract expiring. So it's always three days into that month before. So you're not, it's not optimal, uh, but it's, it's, it, it can be a solid rule. But you could also set it to say the day the open interest goes from April to June, that's the day I roll. So there are, there are systems to help you with that uh, situation. But I, I think as Morris said, don't overthink it too much. Uh, have some rules. Uh, it's not about having the best role, even though there are, I'm sure, firms that spend a lot of time and effort trying to to make the most out of the role situation as well. But I think for long-term trend followers, um, the role is just the role. And uh, yeah, just move on with it. Any Anything you want to add, Jerry, to this? Well, I'm a, <clears throat> I might be a little bit more, um, less rule-based yep. than that. I might, um, you know, there's things you have to do and then things where you may have a little bit more flexibility. So maybe I would look at the trend of the spread and maybe get out quicker, try to get out of that a little quicker if the spread is going against me or hang on. I've definitely hung on before in some of the markets that um, a commodity market that is having issues with delivery or weather. We hang around that front month a little bit longer if you can, uh, always looking at it from a sort of a trend perspective. But I think given what you guys are saying, this is what leads most CTAs to use continuous contracts. And... Um, it's very rare that you just wouldn't go ahead and roll um, and not to be too concerned with uh, his example in the cattle, I think, uh, waiting waiting for something better. That strikes me as something that uh, you don't want to say too often. I'm waiting for something better. Uh, yeah, just go ahead and do what you know you're supposed to do. But there are situations where I get confused. Uh, okay, the Continuous contract is great in the currencies and in the interest rates, but not euro dollars, I don't think. And then, but this uh, commodity contract looks so much different. I mean, the continuous contract of the natural gas, uh, recent natural gas, is much different than the contracts of natural gas. So uh, I'm confused. So don't send us more questions because I don't know the answer. <laughs> you just figure it out for yourself. <laughs> When you do find the answer, John, let's uh, let us know. Um, okay, exactly. Yes. Okay, cool. Um, Michael has uh, another question, which will be the last question for today, actually. So, uh, Michael says, um, "My question is: How large a trading organizations have the confidence to execute well? For the individual trader, the process is pretty straightforward. By the time they've written their system, they know it so well." Uh, they can practically throw it away. One look at the data and they know what the system is going to tell them uh, to do. In a larger fund where systems are not built by the people who decide whether or not to use them, how do those executives become confident enough in that system to start trading? Do they need to be intimately familiar with the code and stats or is there just... Uh, or is there just that much trust between people in those type of organizations? Mm, interesting question, actually. I mean, I'm happy to to give it a go from our side. Um, actually, one of the things that um, we like to do on our side, and no, we're not by any means uh, one of the big uh, shops in this industry, but we actually like our re researchers also to be able to code so when they have and as they develop ideas that they have to do the coding themselves in order to make sure that they get any every nuance into the code that they have in their head. Uh, now, it doesn't mean that they will, uh, you know, in isolation didn't decide whether we would trade that model or not. That's uh, for sure uh, decided by a committee 
um, consisting of people who who may actually not have developed that model themselves. But um, our research team works pretty close with one another, and and of course, developing a model takes months, if not years, and where there are weekly reviews uh, on the you know along the way. So everyone will have a very good understanding as to what we're trying to achieve with a particular new strategy uh, or model to make that final decision, um, you know, if, if, if it comes to that point, because there are many hoops that, uh, that we use in our product development or model development uh, that needs to, to fall into place before we even get to the point of, of including it into the client portfolios. But it's an, in, it's an interesting question. I think with larger organizations, you'll certainly have that issue where uh, the people who maybe come up with the ideas may not be the ones uh, who, who does the, the, uh, the final programming. Um, yeah. What, 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 what is your experience, Jerry and Moritz, on this point? Uh, maybe I misheard the question. I thought he, I, I was just going to say that um, regard, I think the, the proper process and committees like you, that's all good stuff. But I think once it hits the execution desk or the execution algorithm, it's going to get yeah, done. Sure. We don't need the traders or the execution people to feel confident. Your, your job is to, one group has come up with the systems and the coding and they're happy and the proper processes. Then once the trades get generated, the other group does the trades. And it's really a nice division of duties because back when you're a one man uh, shop looking at the quote machine, uh, your emotions, it's a, it's a way to eliminate emotions. The trades are going to get done. Uh, you can't stop them. That's the way I look at it. We had a process where, oops, can't stop it. I can't stop it. I created the systems, helped create them. The execution guys, they can't stop it. And so it helps you be more disciplined. Yeah, I agree. I agree. If, if, if that was the, the angle uh, you had, Michael, on the question, I completely agree with what Jerry says. Uh, absolutely. What about you, Moritz? Anything you want to add to that uh, particular point? Full agreement. And it may, maybe just to give uh, kudos to the guys doing the executions, because uh, I, I work in such an environment as well. The uh, It's really important to have those people there. And, you know, they they do a fantastic job, you know, getting the trades into the market, not leaving the fill open um, or the order open, like going after every fill, you know, seeing where those markets trade, how you want to, you know, get that trade done. I, uh, I think it's a extremely important function to have that execution desk uh, uh, running well and sometimes feel that they don't get enough credit for it. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Yeah, the execution, uh, the slippage, these are very important exactly. parts. Uh, can we trade this market? How big can we trade it? Uh, the eggheads upstairs who are looking and coding and stuff, they're not uh, necessarily always in tune with the real world. Uh, so I've got my head trader has worked with me for over 25 years. And so I don't go unless he tells me I can go. I'm pushing more uh, more diversification. Let's do this market. I heard so-and-so trades it. Yeah, I talked to them. They trade two lots. You know, uh, they trade 10 billion. They trade two lots in this market. So, yeah, the merging of theoretical with practical. You got to rely upon your experienced traders. And it's interesting you say that because, of course, I was, uh, you know, working uh, for you, Jerry, back when, when uh, you know, Anil was uh, was there as well. So he is one of your longest uh, lieutenants. And it's actually the same thing uh, at our shop. Um, the three head guys uh, of our trading uh, group, uh, you know, have been with the firm for, you know, 20 years. Uh, and it's extraordinary, but it's an extraordinary value to have people like that, uh, you know, sitting with a, a truly important uh, part of, of, uh, of, yeah, of, of what we do. So, yeah. Those were the questions this week. Uh, thanks, John, Michael, and, uh, and Jim for sending in your uh, comments and questions. Keep it coming. Um, send it to uh, info at toptradersunplugged.com and we'll do our best uh, to, uh, to fit it in. Um, and um, let me just quickly run through the performance this week, which uh, or this month actually, which uh, might be a little bit surprising. Certainly, when I saw the numbers, uh, knowing what our performance is and 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 what you talked about, Moritz. Um, but actually, the industry so far as of Thursday, although I think Friday was not a good day for 
for the industry. But as of Thursday this week, uh, Beta 50 was up 0.91% uh, for the uh, month of uh, April, up 262 for the year. SOC Gen CT index up about half a percent, up two and a half for the year. SOC Gen trend uh, up just shy of 1%, up uh, 3.87 for the year. Uh, Short-term traders index down about a percent for the month, uh, down 2.73% for the year. And the bridge alternatives uh, up slightly, 19 basis points uh, for the month of April, up 1.12% for the year. Any final thoughts um, before we wrap up, so to speak? No, but great show today. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah, well, we get a lot of, uh, we like it because I feel more confident we're getting we're getting more people involved and you get the listeners and everybody, the Twitter, we're helping us make a better show and the hour versus one and a half, that's... Let's hear your thoughts. Brian. Let's hear you. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Even though we can't guarantee that we can actually keep it to less than an hour and a half now, it seems to become our new, our new standard. Um, but anyways... Um, you know, if you felt you get some value from these uh, conversations, please do share them uh, with your own followers, of course. And as always, we would be ever so grateful if you would leave us a rating and review in iTunes because they really do have uh, an impact and allow other investors to discover the Systematic Investor Series. From Jerry, Moritz and me, thanks so much for listening. And we look forward to being back with you next week. Thanks for listening to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. If you enjoy this series, go on over to iTunes and leave an honest rating and review. And be sure to listen to all the other episodes from Top Traders Unplugged. If you have questions about systematic investing, send us an email with the word question in the subject line to info at toptradersunplugged.com and we'll try to get it on the show. And remember, all the discussion that we have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their products before you make investment decisions. Thanks for spending some of your valuable time with us, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Systematic Investor.